Just when we thought the 1990 wave of democracy and democratization had swept across Africa, little could one expect such a turnaround of events on the African continent 30 plus years later. To put things into context, in 1990, an international conference was held in Lobo, France under the auspices of the then French President François Mitterrand. The prime objective of this gathering was to ensure that democracy, a liberalist conception which had won over communist ideologies so its seeds in Africa, most precisely French Africa. More so, it also appeared to be a new condition for African nations to continue benefiting from foreign aid, or should I say Western aid. Although democracy will only be the first of such staunch obligations, many other will follow in the next decades, gender equality, privatization, and today LGBTQ+. The African continent from the 1960s to the 1980s was popularly known for its coups, with Nigeria having up to eight coups, with six being successful in its short history since independence. Since 1999, the country has somewhat democratically transferred power. Burkina Faso has known over 10 coups, with eight being successful, Mali on the other side has known eight coups with five successes, just to name a few. Before, and worse after independence, factions which contributed to the liberation of their country saw themselves torn apart due to their urge to all rise to the top office of magistracy. It is in this line that parties, military leaders and guerrilla warriors silenced one another, leading to over 215 coups since 1952, with Sudan topping the list with 17 coups, Burundi 11, Burkina Faso 10, Ghana 10, Sierra Leone 10, Comores 9, Nigeria, Mali, Guinea-Bissau and Benin all at 8. The continent has however experienced a long time of serenity and democratic practices, although not as the Western ways. Proof being, from 2000 to 2019, the continent has experienced 39 coups, with roughly 16 being successful. This is a remarkable record compared to previous decades who had 30 coups on average per decade. What could have subsequently happened in the last four years that has ignited the necessity and urge to overthrow democratically elected governments, leading to nine coups and seven successes in such a short period of time? As elements of response, we are going to establish this under three prism, political, economic and socio-cultural. Politically speaking, Africa has known two dominant school of thoughts when it comes to its freedom. On the one hand, those who firmly believe that African countries have never gained independence, but rather were subdued in an imperialist covenant which still plagued the continent to labor for ex-colonial territories. On the other hand, we have theorists who rather think bad governance and egocentric practices of African leaders is at the center of African problems. Although both may account for the stagnation of Africa on the international chessboard, how does that explain the surge in coups? For the first school of thought, the rise in coups can be explained through the continuous interference of Western countries in the affairs of nations in the continent. As a matter of fact, those who bring money dictates the way further of events and programs, they say. This has been seen in foreign aid clauses, and today, the African Union, fundamental institution of African unity, trade and cooperation is partially funded by the European Union. Believers of this thought think that, as a means to profit from these funding and investments, these nations interfere in national policies to favor their agenda. In order to ensure continuity of these malpractices, these nations places their puppets as president. As consequence, the country doesn't fully benefit from its potentials as all efforts are tilted towards the foreign metropolis. This explanation has been used for the case of Mali. Moving further, these observations led to the rise of movements and populist groups who have since then demanded the immediate withdrawal of such governments from power. The mounting pressures from such factions led to chaos within territories like Burkina Faso, Guinea Conakry, Mali and Niger, where leaders from these groups and even the youth began anti-European campaigns in favor of their full independence. Some have gone as far as stating that jihadist and terrorist insurgents in the Sahel were all orchestrated by France and partners, their reason being the monopoly of the natural resources of these countries like uranium for the case of Niger and gold for the case of Mali. It is important to note that one-third of France's energy supply comes from Africa. The lack of such vital resources could devastating for a France that wants to remain competitive on the international arena. 
The Alta measures taken by these factions were to orchestrate a coup d'etat against governments they considered illegitimate. This eventually led to the very first in Mali where Colonel Asimi Goita overthrew the government of Ibrahim Boubacar Keita in August 2020 and later orchestrated a second coup against the transitional government he helped set up. Despite economic sanctions which followed by ECOWAS and the failure of the international community, the Malian military junta which today controls Mali have gone ahead to take measures which will ensure the sovereignty of their country. They have since then end diplomatic ties with France, exiled figures who jeopardize their actions and have equally asked for the end and withdrawal of Manasco, a UN peacekeeping mission in Mali. Subsequently, coups for somewhat same reasons followed in Guinea Conakry where Special Forces Commander Mamadi Dambuya overthrew the government of Alpha Condé on September 5, 2021, and then Burkina Faso with first Paul Henri Damaba overtaking the government of Christian Rock Cabore and later himself overthrown by Captain Ibrahim Tro who wasn't satisfied of the leadership of his predecessor. The most recent being Niger, where President Mohamed Bazoum saw himself taken out in a coup which didn't even last a day. Economically, African countries and French-speaking nations in particular are well known for the extraversion of its economy, whereby most produce what they don't consume and consume what they don't produce. In times of inflation and devaluation, such nations are hit the most severely, as they cannot compete with their dominant agricultural products. In return, we experience a leap in unemployment, poverty, and insecurity as the most affected succumb into malicious techniques to take from those who got little or more. The accumulated anger from the consequences of such a system has contributed to mount the anti-French sentiment in these nations, as France is seen as the foster child of such unequal balance in international trade and development due to dominance in trade and currency control. This has contributed to widespread suffering on the continent, reducing the power parity of the most vulnerable. The immediate victims have been governments who weren't and haven't been able to provide the most basic needs to their population at the most acceptable cost possible, as was the case with Niger. Also, the control by France of French-speaking African nations' currencies, the CFA, has over the years animated public debates who see in such a system the continuity of modern-day slavery. anti fa campaigns have been organized on the streets of Bamako and Ouagadougou with youths requesting from courageous leaders and pan-Africanists to put an end to this conundrum. What more could motivate someone who desires to change his country than someone who receives the full support of the masses? With the cause and reason in place, came the action. Military junta in Mali, Guinea Conakry, Burkina Faso and Niger took over their government who to an extent felt under the category of leaders who pursued in a system that isn't and wasn't beneficial to the citizens. Between, Asimi Goita and Mamadi Dumbeya all advanced widespread dissatisfaction of the population, rising corruption and failing economy as motivation behind their takeover. The case of Niger also fits perfectly in this puzzle, as the country wasn't facing any of the two major causes accounting for coups in Africa, high wave insecurity, and peak political disagreements. The major reason put forth by the military junta has been the poor economic management of President Bazoum, whose leadership saw Niger taking up places as one of the poorest countries on earth. Unemployment has never been as high under his presidency, and corruption became money current in a country with minimum wage of roughly 30.000 FCFA. The unbelievable fact about this is that, Niger is the third producer of uranium in the world and became an oil country since 2011 with its resources powering foreign nations. How did we get to the point where a major provider of one of the world's most precious minerals is classified on a list of the global poorest? Probably the same thoughts which have seen sparked controversy in Niger, providing answers to why a greater part of the population is aligning behind the military junta, who are seen as saviors in a seized and expropriated democracy favoring a few elite. Socioculturally, the world and not only Africa has been put face to wall with a rise in public opinion and belongingness. The opinions of even minorities have begun dominating public talks and have pushed for a greater consideration of what the population think is right than what is actually or supposedly right. The past decade has known an explosion of pan-Africanist, whose ambitions it has been to free completely and totally African nations from the control of ex-metropolis. Natalie Yam and Kemi Saber have so far been the most popular personalities spearheading this new pan-Africanism, also partly due to digitalization. However, 
foreign powers have over time doubted their credibility and have considered them as puppets of the Kremlin. These maneuvers have not so far discouraged a growing youth population who want to be in full control of their emancipation and future. Nonetheless, it has rather fueled a belief that these newly self-proclaimed pan-Africanists stand the best chance to free the continent from new imperialism. Another major contribution has been the role played by Russia and military operating firm Wagner in economic cooperation and security issues in Africa. The belief that the enemy of my enemy is my friend is clearly portrayed in this existing relationship between most African nations and Russia. Russia has increased its investment in Africa and have mobilized two Russia-Africa summits on cooperation, becoming a rising major actor in development programs on the continent. She has gone as far as cancelling most, if not all of Africa's debt. Their works which have so far been mutually beneficial have built a growing anti-Western feeling, which sees in Russia the messiah of the continent. But what truly does Africa want? Run from one colonial master to another? This questioning has also piqued the curiosity of young thinkers, who will prefer complete freedom from all foreign powers and the reinstallation of Africa's major role on the international chessboard. There is, however, another wing of thinkers who believe that with the competitiveness of the globe, interstate cooperation and military alliances, it is wiser for African nations to align against those nations who aren't in their best interest. This probably accounts for why major national development programs and multi-billion cooperations have tilted towards China and Russia. This new alliance has however been challenged by renowned writers like Dambisa Moyo in her book, Winner Take All, China's Race for Resources and What It Means for the World, where she argues that China is in a mad rush for the control of those very resources that underpin our being, and that these global control by China could have irreversible effects on the global economy and geopolitics. What Moyo shows is we are in the middle of unprecedented times. She details how China has embarked on one of the greatest commodity rushes in history and examines the effects this is having on us all. Where is China taking control of land and water? Mostly in Africa, I suppose, who is giving up their title to these precious resources. What will be the financial and geopolitical effect of all this? Hitherto, it is rather evident that the growing African youth population has decided to risk it all on this China-Russia bait, and as results, in less than three years, West Africa has known six coups. Two in Mali, two in Burkina Faso and one in Guinea-Conakry and Niger. The ease with which these have been orchestrated leaves one to think that, on both sides of belligerent there are strategic nations who want to ensure the continuous supply of vital resources for their countries. This has been translated through the aggressive sanctions that followed some of these coups, especially that of Mali and Niger, both strategic nations on the west side, housing vital mineral resources like gold, uranium, diamond and bauxite. These sanctions in reality will have far much devastating consequences for citizens that the Putschists. The aftermath of these actions cannot be concluded as of yet, as none of the four Putsch leaders have established a transition agenda from military back to civilian. On the other side, regional blocs like ECOWAS and the international community have not as well been able to define a clear plan of attack and actions. But one thing remains sure and certain, any military intervention in any of the aforementioned territories will lead to an escalation of violence like never before in the history of Africa, creating an unprecedented avalanche of devastating consequences for the most vulnerable communities and persons, already largely affected by the Sahel Jihadis crisis. Conclusively, one can state without doubt accurate measure that the ongoing coup in West Africa are not the fruits of a particular challenge, but rather an amalgamation of historic grievances, which have today translated into coup, youth uprising and widespread pan-Africanism. The growing economic disparity existing between the Grand North and Global South has only been the overlapping droplet, which have further motivated an already angry continent to take up arms through the leadership of the most courageous and maybe better visionaries. But till what extent will such approach be sustainable for Africa, which despite being already a marginalized economic actor globally, now has to deal with an uprise of political instability? What does this mean for nations who still house some of the longer-serving leaders in the world like Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, Congo Brazzaville, and to an extent Gabon? Will the contagion from these West African nations spread to the Central African periphery or other nations like Benin and Togo who is today under Iron Fist leadership? 
Could this eventually lead to the Thucydides trap between rising Russia and falling France? Or should we expect this as the premises of a third world war? Unable to answer these questions myself, one best believes that diplomacy, I mean, sincere and true diplomacy remains the surest means to global peace, wealth and prosperity. Until then, shall we know if the general good will overtake individual egoism?